On behalf of John Piper and the whole team at Desiring God, it's an honor for us to be here. It's an honor for us to, to give away books and to spend this time with you. So thank you for your encouragement, and uh, thank you for the warm welcome. It's been great being on campus again. I think the last time I was here was 2018. We were trying to do the math. Uh, it was in the summer, and uh, we just came on campus. I wanted to see the Spurgeon Center. I'd heard so much about it, had never seen it. And uh, we walked in the room, and, and someone saw us come in, and they came in and turned the lights on for us. <laughs> and uh, it was just, just dead dark, and, and uh, got a little tour then. And ever since, this place has just captured my imagination. I mean, a mecca for those of us who love Spurgeon, but also uh, a place that is, is churning out church planters um, in rural Nebraska and rural Iowa and places that are, are near and dear to my heart as a Midwestern boy who was born in a farming town uh, called Davenport, Nebraska, of about 300 people. And uh, it, it, there's a real challenge to find good Bible-believing, gospel-preaching uh, churches in rural Nebraska and Iowa. So I just love this place for what it represents in uh, sending out ministers into those often overlooked, hard-to-reach places. Well, this past summer, a giant deposit of phosphate rock was discovered in southwestern Norway. Why does that matter? Well, this one area in Norway now contains enough minerals to meet the global demand for batteries and solar power and solar panels for the next 100 years. A mining discovery uh, that's a jackpot of, quote, up to 70 billion tons of the non-renewable resource phosphate which is a key component for building green technologies that currently faces significant supply issues. 70 billion tons. Supply issues, no more. And just two months later, it was announced the discovery of 40 billion tons of lithium found inside the, inside the McDermott Caldera, which is a supervolcano on the Nevada-Oregon border here in the States. That discovery sparked headlines like this one, quote, lithium discovery in U.S. volcano could be the biggest deposit ever found. These are jackpots for fut the future of solar and battery power here in the States and around the world, and they should feed our worship, but they typically don't. Instead, we're conditioned to see these headlines and we go man-centered, right? This is just greedy man doing greedy things. Or we go Luddite, right? This is all of the devil. Let's just ignore it. It's of the devil. Or we go political, right? Like EVs are a liberal fad. Like let's just ignore it, right? We go that way. Or we go greedy. We think like, how can I get stock in this? That's where our minds first go. Like how do we make money on these discoveries? Our minds naturally don't move from mining discoveries to the creator, they naturally don't, and it will not without a reshaping and a recalibrating of our hearts. And so now most of us find it easier to celebrate God's glory in unseen spiritual realities. You know, by faith, we see his glory in the gospel and in our intercessor, Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, ascended and enthroned in heaven interceding for us right now. That's glorious. That is incredibly glorious and unseen. Or we glorify God in the things that are visible, but untouched by man, right? Man has not gotten his filthy mitts on these things. Mountains, oceans, beaches, uh, the Milky Way galaxy on a dark night, the Northern Lights, Man hasn't got his grubby fingers on those things so we can see God's glory in them. But when it comes to the elements buried deep inside the earth that we can excavate and make into shiny new metal things, God's glory diminishes. Deposits of phosphate rock and lithium to us, our ho-hum. And by the time we take those materials and make batteries and solar panels out of them, for many believers, God has been completely rendered irrelevant. The Bible gives us new eyes to see the material world around us in places like Deuteronomy chapter 8, and that's where I want to be this morning. Deuteronomy 8 verses 1 to 10 is where I want to go. As Moses shapes the hearts of his people, Moses is getting God's people ready to live fruitfully in the promised land. People redeemed from a 430-year bondage in Egypt 
then into a 40-year desert wandering period that we'll talk about this morning. It's a hard life. It's been a hard life for Israel, for God's people. But now God's people are being ready to enter this new promised land, a new land, a good land, furnished with everything they could possibly need, even for their future innovations. But their hearts aren't ready yet. So we're going to simply walk through this text beginning in, in verse 1 where Moses says this, quote, the whole commandment that I command to you today shall be, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply, go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. So he says, lasting life, lasting life, abundant life for your obedience. That's the deal. It's a verse that beautifully sets up the gospel for us and the obedience of Jesus Christ. But for now, if Israel upholds their end of the covenant, God promises that his covenant people are going to flourish in this brand new land. They will live and they will multiply. They will become a strong nation on the earth. The small cap Lord here frames everything else we're going to study. The great I am, the great all-sufficient, self-sufficient I am who I am. This self-sufficient Lord promises to give his people the promised land, a promise that's repeated 23 times in Deuteronomy alone. This sworn land is fundamental to their national identity. This land is their national identity. Identity. And while they will flourish if they obey, they will flourish in this land if they obey. The land itself is a pure gift from the Lord. The Lord made this world from nothing. He laid the foundations of the world before any creature existed. God prepared this ground for his people. Pure gift. It's not a payment for their holiness. Chapter 9, this point will be made very clear. Israel is not earning this new land by its self-righteousness. It comes as a gift. This promised land belongs to the Lord. It's his. It's his to give. He designed it. He owns it. He's giving it as a gift of love to this people. And so Israel will take possession of it by faith and flourish in it by obedience. So Israel is warned Israel is warned, don't think that you're morally superior to the people who lived in this land previously to you. This land is a perpetual reminder to them of God's abundant kindness to undeserving sinners. The lesson they should have learned in the desert already, according to verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the, in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. 40 years, for 40 years, God has been humbling his people, bringing them low, testing them. Because when you're brought low, your true self comes out. Pressure squeezes out what is genuinely inside of our hearts. And so God sends adversity to prove the faith of his people, to prove his people. It's like a furnace that burns away all the, whatever is trivial and false and fake in our lives. God tests hearts and he's been testing the heart of his nation. Testing proves our trust in God. Do we really trust in him or not? This whole text is about the heart. So we're going to see time and time again. So God works in the hearts of his people, humbling them even down to their daily diets. Verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. So food is hard to find in the desert. Right? I live in the desert, and if you, the one thing that strikes you about the animals in the desert compared to the animals in the Midwest is animals in the desert are really scrawny. Like the rabbits look like rats, and the deer look like dogs. <laughs> like it's like it's, food is hard to find in the desert. And manna was a miracle food for God's people. It looked like coriander seed, and it appeared in the desert on the ground every morning for 40 years. God's people woke up, they gathered it daily, they ground it up, and they boiled manna cakes out of it. 
cakes that tasted oily and a little bit like honey. Not bad, actually, when you read the descriptions of it. A little oily, tasted like honey, not a bad diet. You get sick of it, of course, but not a bad diet. So where did this daily manna come from? Where did it come from? No one knew. It was a miracle food from God. The grain of heaven made into the bread of angels and eaten in abundance. It was a provision, a gracious, sustaining gift from God that was sweet and pleasant. A daily gift that was there to prove a much bigger point. Verse 3 again, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of of the Lord. That's a glaring contrast here, right? Our hungry mouths are needy. God's mouth sustains all things. Farmers don't keep us alive. Safeway or Costco or Walmart don't keep us alive. We are kept alive by divine miracle. Manna was a miracle food to remind Israel and to remind all of us that life is a sovereign miracle. If you are breathing right now, it is because God has said, live, and you live. And so we live. Groceries are not just, groceries are a means that he uses. Manna was a means that he used. He cares about the means, but the means point to him. The first cause of our life and all life is not what goes into our mouths, but what comes out of his mouth. God says live, and by it he upholds our lives by the word of his power, by miracle. One of many tangible miracles in the history of Israel. Verse 4, your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. 40 years in the desert wearing the same old clothes, the same old sandals, and it didn't wear out. None of it wore out. God involved himself down to the level of how fast their clothes wore out. That is an amazing providence. On display for his people down to the most mundane material provisions of Israel's life. Footwear. Again, I live in the desert. We go through shoes like crazy. The desert is really hard on your shoes. God's generosity here is obvious in the most basic provisions he has made for his people. Verse five, know then in your heart, it's all about the heart again, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So God has brought discipline, training, He's training human behavior. He's training his people. For 40 years in the desert, God was discipling his people, resetting their behaviors and preparing their hearts all along for a brand new home, preparing them to trust and obey him in a materially prosperous land. Why? Verse six, so you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. The basic point of verses two to six is this. Arrogance is unbefitting for people about to inherit the gift of God's land. For 40 years, God was humbling his people, testing their hearts and training their gratitude for a good land. And all of this prep builds up now to the very promised land itself. And that's where I want to focus on this morning. So what's so special about this good land? Verse 7, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. The Lord is bringing them. The Lord is bringing them. God's people are being led by the hand toward this gift. Have you ever bought someone a gift so big that you couldn't wrap it up? What's the only way to give a gift that big? You put a blindfold on the person you're going to give it to, and then you lead that person by the hand to the gift, right? That's what we do. This is, in a sense, what God is doing. God's people are being led by the hand towards a gift. That's God here. He's leading his people by the hand to the gift of this land. Again, his kindness frames this entire story. And it's not just any land. Did you notice a good land? That's the title. That's the title of this land. We, we typically call it the promised land. You can call it the promised land. But literally, you could call it the good land. That's its name, the good land. 
It has everything that will need to flourish. The land is useful and productive. The land is abundant and beautiful. It's fruitful and it's beautiful at the same time. And that, of course, means for any desert people, water. (laughs) Verse 7, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills. Amazing picture here. The good land is rich with water flowing deep under the ground. Water breaks out from deep springs into fountains and flowing rivers. And God made it this way. He made the land this way. Long ago, he cut deep fountains into his creation. Descriptions of flowing water speaking to God's original work into the promised land. God had pre-cut channels into the rock for fresh water to flow throughout the land. Long ago, long ago, this land was being readied for God's thirsty people before God's people even existed. And where water flows, grains and fruit abound. Of course, verse eight, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Remember when the spies took their first peek into the promised land, the evidence they took back were grapes, pomegranates, and figs, right? This is a great place to live because it's loaded with fruit. What more do you need than that, right? A land of amazing and delicious fruits, fruits to make jams and wines flow like rivers. Sorry, Baptist. I'm a Baptist. We'll, We'll bleep that out. Verse 8, a land of olive trees, not just olives, literally oil-rich olives, the best olives you can imagine in the land. The land flows with olive oil, oil for worship sacrifices, oil to anoint, oil for cooking, for baking, for skincare, for hygiene, oil for medicine to treat wounds, oil to fuel lamps and give light. Olive oil was abundantly useful for all of life already there, prepared for God's people. Verse eight, of course, honey. A land of milk and honey, right? The land flows with milk and honey, and you can't have honey without bread. Verse nine, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. That phrase, in which you will lack nothing, is sort of a summary statement. That's the punchline here. The chief characteristic of the promised land itself is this. In this place, all scarcity and all shortage is completely negated. There's no lack here. No lack. Why? Because the land is loaded with everything you could materially imagine. All waiting. God is comprehensively aware of the entire scope of our material lives, and he makes a creation to meet it. And so the land abounds. And that means, and here's where I want to camp for a few minutes this morning, it is, verse 9, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. We talk about it as the land flowing with milk and honey. We don't typically talk about it as the land flowing with iron and copper. It's right there in the text. This land lacks nothing because its rocks and hills are loaded with bronze and iron. Mentioned together, bronze and iron symbolize power and military might, military strength. Power and might are already in the land. Iron will be taken from stones. Iron meant wealth. It could be traded, and iron was immediately useful in all areas of life. Iron made tools for soldiers, tools for stonecutters, tools for carpenters, tools for farmers. Iron was used for axles, reinforced reinforced wheels, chariots. All of those things could be made using iron. Even more diversely useful was copper. Copper will be excavated from the hills. It will be the most commonly used material used for jewelry. It will be polished into mirrors. I think bronze, think early mirrors. Copper mixed with tin made bronze. Bronze is a hard and durable metal. Farmers will use bronze for plow points, for sleshing threshing sledges, axes, pruning shears, yokes, sickles. 
Soldiers will use bronze for chains, chain mail, armor, helmets, shields, javelins, bows, arrows, and to fortify city walls and gates. Stonemasons will use bronze tools to cut and shape rock, and God's worshipers will use copper and bronze musically to make symbols. Most importantly, David will prepare for the temple by acquiring iron and bronze in quantities beyond weighing. So David just hoards the iron and the bronze. And then his son Solomon will take that iron and bronze beyond weighing, we're told in the Old Testament, and build the temple. One to dazzle the world with its shiny copper things. Pots, shovels, basins, furniture, altars, entire doors made of bronze. Bronze hardware will be everywhere, all by God's design. God's nation has been handed all the iron and bronze needed to build the temple that gleams in the sunshine to attract the nations, to show them the beauty of of Israel's God. And it is within God's redemptive history that iron and bronze and human inventiveness will find their home. Israel's unweighable abundance of iron and copper and bronze is as much a gift from God as the manna they ate in the desert every day. All these weapons, all these tools, all these decorations to beautify God's house, all of it God coded into the promised land at creation by his design. One reason the good land lacked nothing is because it was designed with all of Israel's tools and technologies needed in mind. All of Israel's future tool needs were met and pre-coded into the good land by God from the beginning of time as a gracious gift of the creator's design given in order to shape Israel's material future. That blew my mind the first time I realized that. God's sovereign design for a nation, for any nation, is tied to its available natural resources. And who's getting the praise for the shiny metal things that a nation can build? Well, here it is in Israel's technological future, verse 10. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. God says, I get all the praise for this. There again is its name, the good land. You see that again? The good land, a land without lack. So praise the creator of this good land. When you have all this prosperity, thank God for it. It's his generosity. You have it by his design, right? The full implications of these few verses deserve a whole book. And I think they're going to hand out that book to you as you leave. So there's a lot more to say. But here are four statements that I think only the people, people uh, who, who um, treasure God, who believe in God, who know there's a creator, there's, only, there's four things that we, we alone in this world can affirm. And I'm going to go through those four affirmations as we close. Number one, follow human inventions back to the creator. Follow human inventions back to the creator. The one who laid the foundations of the world is the one who dug deep channels for water and the one who channeled that water infused into his creation is the same God who infused iron and copper into that creation for his people's material prosperity. God put iron and copper in creation to inspire us to build with iron and copper. Israel's future inventions are coded in creation. So where does material technology come from? Where does technology come from materially? The Lord. God's sovereign plan for each nation unfolds according to the available resources that nation has been given. It was the creator who suggested. Let's put 70 billion tons of high-grade phosphate in Southwest Norway. It was the creator who said, let's put 40 billion tons of lithium in Nevada for them to find in 2023. That's one way the creator sovereignly guides the future of nations 
by how he designs his creation. If you think that's only true for Israel and not Europe, I will add a quote from our friend Spurgeon. I'm gonna add Spurgeon into our chat. I can't talk technology without a Spurgeon quote. He literally takes my breath away when I read phrases that Spurgeon says historically. Um, He was pondering the telegraph once and he said, isn't it amazing that we've harnessed the lightning to communicate our messages? We've harnessed the lightning to communicate our messages. That's what the digital age is. When I read that quote, my, my jaw fell open. It's like, where did electricity come from? Did we invent electricity? No. It was here before we existed. Read Elihu's sermon in Job. Where did lightning come from? It's God. We just modeled that. We just captured it. We harnessed lightning. And now what do we do with lightning? You shoot messages with it. Spurgeon was always, always already thinking in those categories of harnessing the lightning to communicate. He was talking about the telegraph, but that's basically the, the essence of the digital age that we live in. So Spurgeon is amazing. I cannot talk about technology without a Spurgeon quote. He got it. He totally got it. And it would be unforgivable for him to speak here and without a Spurgeon mention. Here he is landing a sermon illustration about coal. He's talking about coal in a, in a sermon. Spurgeon said this, quote, a man looking at the coal mines of England naturally considers, naturally considers, okay, so he's just, he assumes everyone in England can just work this theology out. A man looking at the coal mines of England naturally considers that God made that coal with the intention of supplying the world's inhabitants with fuel. Who, who invented coal? It's God's idea. God invented coal. He puts it in, into his creation, maybe at the flood. And he, this is Spurgeon, and that he stored it, as it were, away in those dark cellars underground for this favored nation, England, that the wheels of its commerce might be set in motion. End quote. Spurgeon knew God made coal. It was his idea. He made it for man to discover and to burn. Then he hid that coal. The creator hid that coal underground until just the right moment in time to reveal his generosity to England and to fire her economic engine in time, in due time. That's how Christians view the material world through the lens of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Spurgeon got it. He got it. Our inventions unfold according to the discoveries we continue to make into God's creation in God's timing. And so Israel was positioned to discover and invent and build being gratefully aware that all the material resources, the imagination, the planning, the skills, the energy that it needed to flourish, all of it was given to them by gracious God. God governs the unfolding story of nations of Israel and of Norway and of the United States by governing the story of human inventiveness by how he designed the creation. Number two, marvel. Marvel at God's glory exposed in our mining discoveries. (laughs) Marvel at God's glory exposed in our mining discoveries. We're not going to go there. But you can write down Job 28, verses 1 to 11. It's all about mining. It fits here in this message. It's an amazing hymn that celebrates human technology and human discovery, specifically of man's technological ability to excavate what's in the earth. That text led theologian Abraham Kuyper to say this, quote, and this is long before the digital age. Abraham Kuyper, long before the digital age, quote, man was designed and intended for digging up what God has hidden in the earth and for glorifying the greatness of God through doing this. God enclosed gold and silver, all precious metals and precious stones in the heart of the earth. And if there had been no human beings to bring these treasures to the surface 
and to let the luster of the gold shine and to bring out the brilliance of the diamond by cutting it, then God would have never received the honor and praise for these minerals. It's true of gold. It's true of silver. It's true of diamonds. True of the brass for the temple. True of coal. True of high-grade phosphate and the resources that feed our economies today. Miners continue to set free from an otherwise unseen creative brilliance that points us back to the creator. Number three, enjoy the creator in your inventions. Enjoy the creator in your inventions. We so easily miss the main point of why mining exists. And Kuiper just said it. Many previous nations have failed here, and we will fail here too if we're not careful. We must also heed God's warning in Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18. So what's the safe way to go about all this, all this innovation? Should we, as God's people, just diss some material things and say, that's greed, that's humans doing greedy things, scraping all of these minerals out of their earth. That's just, that's just humans doing wicked things or coercive things, or do we scoff at electric vehicles, or do we just ignore the Norway discovery as vain worldliness? What do we do with this material abundance? It says right here, verse 17, beware, this is speaking to God's people here, beware lest you say in your heart, okay, we're back to the heart. You're going to say with your mouth something that's in your heart. Don't do this. Here it is. What our industries do with all that high-grade phosphate rock in Norway or the lithium in Nevada is one thing. What our heart does with all of that, that phosphate rock and lithium, those discoveries, is the concern of our God, the heart of his people. The far big, bigger issue is this. Do you see God's generosity or not? What happens in your heart when you read about those discoveries? with this culture making and city building and human tech making. Here's the temptation. Do not do this. Do not say this. Verse 17, my power and the might of my hand have given me this wealth. That's the mistake. That's the mistake. Claiming credit for it. Israel, when you've settled into this land, you will stand back and you will enjoy the skyline of your cities. You'll look at the houses that you have built. You're going to look at the new shoes that you've been able to manufacture, the new clothes that you wear, all the copper and the brass and the iron tools that you invented to make you strong and prosperous and wealthy. Your temple will shine like the sun. You will see oil and wine flowing from your industry. You will see farmers hauling carts of grain. You will see bakeries full of bread. Your markets will be full of food. You will make banks and financial systems and succeed in international trade. And if you fail to see God's generosity in all of it, you are an idolater. The only explanation for why anything in this world works, why technology works, why iPhones work, why our cars work, our computers work, our batteries work, why we can generate wealth, it's all owing to the power and generosity of God in the creation he gave us. Instead, verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. I would have expected him to say, uh, praise me because I gave you the raw materials. God claims the glory here for every penny of Israel's wealth. He claims credit for the ultimate final product of all of Israel's industry. So you say, what what does God want praise for? The sickle, um, all the tools that the farmer uses, or or all the bread, or all the the olive oil? Like, what is God claiming credit credit for? He's claiming credit for the entire economic momentum of Israel. (laughs) It's all because of him. He gets the power, he gets the praise for all the power and the wealth of Israel. He claims it all. Every single penny. He claims. He claims credit not merely for the iron and the copper buried in the ground or the phosphorus and lithium buried in the ground, but for the power to excavate these materials. And then he claims credit for the wealth generated by whatever we turn those things into. He wants credit for it all. Solar panels panels and batteries, he's claiming credit for it. 
Why? Because all industrial wealth is traced back to its first cause, God's generosity in his creation. The God who gives out manna day by day in the desert is the same God who plants mineral deposits to spur Israel's creativity and to spur us forward in our batteries, our solar panels, and economic wealth, all at same God, same generosity. Do you see it? You see it. Or is it just Silicon Valley's power? It's a human power doing that. Every nation is held accountable here. Verses 19 to 20, I think, uh, suggest that. You don't do that, you get booted out of the land. Everything we make spotlights God's abounding generosity. So build houses, burn coal, make batteries and solar panels if you want to, build economic systems, engage in international trade, grow trees for lumber to build homes, harness the lightning and electrify your cities, replicate the sun in nuclear fusion, listen as the creator helps you max out your farm yields, make new things out of metal, make new cars, make EVs if you want. Make more comfortable clothing materials. Make new gadgets. And when you do all of it, people of God, enjoy God in it and see his generosity in those gifts. God never assumes his people will do this well. The assumption here is God's people don't do this well. God's people grow blind to his material generosity. If we hold our iPhone up and we can't see God's generosity in it, What excuse do we have? This world will condition us to see as Christians, to see mining headlines and to think man-centered thoughts. This is corporate greed, greedy men doing greedy things. Or Luddite thoughts, this is all of the devil. I'm gonna ignore this. Or we go political, EVs are a fad. Or we go greedy, right? How do I get stuck in this? I I wanna capture some money in this. Not altogether wrong, but if that's where your heart goes first, that's wrong. We're wired to do everything but move from mining discoveries to the iPhone to the creator's generosity. We find that so unnatural. The world doesn't help us to do that. And Deuteronomy 8 corrects us. Finally, number four, employ your inventions to reach the nations. Employ your inventions to reach the nations. We often make the mistake of thinking technology is outside of redemptive history and inconsequential to the church. We see in Deuteronomy 8 and all of the, several other texts in, in, in the Bible, this is not true. God tells us a story of human inventiveness. Silicon Valley, it's not just humans doing human things. It's not just Babel. It's not just rebellion. Just ignore it. When we open our Bibles, we find the story of human innovation woven right into redemptive history. It's woven right into it as God claims credit for everything we make out of metal, our gadgets, our cities, temples, homes, economies, technology is there, but not as some intruder into God's redemptive plan, but as a servant, a servant within God's redemptive plan. We have tech because we have a mission. We have tech because we have a mission. There's a world of lost sinners to reach, and so the temple needs brass, and the missionary's bush plane needs gas. The temple needs the gleam, and the missionary needs gasoline to get a bush plane into remote places. And God is the first cause of both, both the brass and the gasoline. The best of our inventions are missionally useful. The best of them. Israel's iron and brass was meant to attract the nations. And in the story of the church, we could talk about the history of metallurgy and the iron nails that were used on the cross or the invention of the Greek language to codify a far-reaching tongue, or the brilliance of the Roman road, or of wooden ships, or the Codex Bible, or the printing press, or steam trains, steam ships, fossil fuels, combustion engines, off-road trucks, bush planes, everything needed to pull off a Spurgeon sermon, right? You need some sort of engineering so that 3,000 people can come here Spurgeon, right? That's innovation, a Billy Graham revival meeting, right? You get 100,000 people in a, in a huge stadium so that Billy Graham can preach the gospel. That requires all sorts of technology, right? Or to show the Jesus film in a dark village. Or to broadcast the gospel on AM, FM radio. Or for digital media to enter closed and remote, remote countries through smartphones. Which is happening, we know, at DG all over the world, in closed Muslim countries, John Piper's sermons are getting through and being heard. 
Tech exists because the church exists. Tech exists because the church exists. Tech exists because the Great Commission exists. Here's the bottom line. In 70 billion tons of phosphate in Norway, or 40 billion tons of lithium in Nevada, never, never grow blind to God's incredible generosity on display for us in his creation. Marvel at the maker. Marvel at the first cause. Don't watch a SpaceX rocket fly up into space and marvel at the powers of man. Watch a SpaceX rocket launch and don't diss on man. See beyond man. Marvel at these powers that God imagined before any human being walked on this planet. And marvel in your heart at the foresight of a maker whose creation would produce rockets and cars and gasoline and batteries and solar panels and iPhones and thousands of innovations we're using right now that we take for granted so that I can speak and so that you can hear. 10,000 innovations you used this morning to get here for granted. Let's pray. God, how dull we grow to your abundant generosity. I feel that in my own heart. I've become so dull to the abundance that you have given me. And then we can baptize our ignoring of you and call call it Luddism, call Luddism holy. Like ignoring you is somehow a form of holiness. We grow so blind to your abounding kindness in this creation. We need help. We need your help in our hearts. This is a spiritual war for our hearts. This is a spiritual war for our homes. Help us to raise our children to see the stewardship involved in the digital media that is a gift. If we can't convince them that digital media is a gift, we will never convince them to steward those gifts to glorify you. Help us to use language. Help us to use ideas to convince them of your generosity and the power and potency of the gifts that we have, that we can use them to love you and to love others, or we can use them for hellish purposes. That stewardship basis we need, our kids need, our teens need desperately to see your generosity in the iPhone so that they honor and glorify you by what they do with it. The truth is we enjoy a tech wealth beyond anything this world has ever seen before. We are spoiled in every way, every day. Most days just blind to your generosity. Open our hearts, open our minds to see your incredible kindness all around us. And so we pray in the face of your abounding generosity all around us, open spiritual eyes in Norway and in Nevada and here in the Midwest, in Iowa, in Nebraska, in Kansas City, open eyes to see your generosity. You can do that by the power of your spirit. Our lives are stock full of copper, aluminum, and silicon, lasers and gasoline and nuclear electricity and computer chips and gadgets and high-grade phosphate rock. Protect us from idolizing all of it. Protect protect us from hating it. Both of those things belittle you. Show us your glory in the material world you have given us as you teach us to wisely use and steward our technology to love you more, to love others on mission, and so fulfill the great commission you've called us to. In Christ's glorious name we pray, amen.